Yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, modern Fortran, um, which could be, on one hand, considered a contradiction in itself. Uh, on the other hand, since it's apparently still in use, uh, we could also ask the question whether it's a future-proof language or not, so something that you can actually use also, not, not only today, but also in uh, the next decades. Uh, given the drawing I have here, yeah, I mean, um, yeah you, Fortran has been around for 65 years now. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's going to have its 65th birthday yes, this year. It was published in 1957 for the first time by John Bacchus. Mm -hmm. Basically, it was at that time the first um, portable compiled language. Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, similar it, the development was for COBOL um, at much the same time, but that was an entirely different segment of the, of the uh, industry. Uh, different than uh, dead horses, dinosaurs are still alive. Um, so, and there seem to be two main reasons. Um, uh, this, this specific dinosaur has is still in use. Uh, there are communities where Fortran is used, um, focused, of course, on data intensive uh, numerical cal calculations in various uh, scientific areas of, uh, of endeavor, uh, but also, of course, partly in the military. The scientific complex, which of course certainly has a has an impact on uh, the continued use of the language. Another um, uh, item that is worth mentioning is that the effort, the, the effort of learning the language versus the usefulness you can expect from it, uh, this ratio is pretty pretty good uh, compared to other languages. I mean, C plus plus is a very very powerful language, in some senses more powerful than Fortran, but. Uh, learning the complete language is rather a chore. Uh, for Fortran, while the language has grown, um, um, it's not quite as bad. Uh, typically, you will only learn a subset anyway, but it's a much larger subset of the complete language than, than in C++. Yeah, the second, uh, the second item is uh, that the dinosaur actually has adapted over time. Uh, so Fortran is similar to C++, not a language that's been defined once and then kept the same way forever. And in fact, the language evolution is not driven by one, but by two committees, um, which at first sight might sound a little bit strange. Uh, the more bureaucracy, does that really deliver better results? Uh, this had actually historical reasons. Uh, when Fortran 90 was developed, there was a big, uh, big quarrel about what to do and what not to do. And, um, and so this, this led to this work, work, working versus implementation balance that's observed nowadays. So the feature definitions are done basically by the International Standards Committee, while the technical implementation of the standard is uh, is done by the US National Body. Yeah, uh, the other thing is, of course, to bring the news to the masses, you also need technical literature. So the technical literature has done its best to keep up. and. Indeed, for us, the last decade or so, numerous titles uh, sporting uh, modern Fortran in the name have cropped up. Um, in Naked Self Interest, I put out the, this book, especially large, uh, because I've uh, been accorded the honor to, uh, to work on the next edition as a co author uh, on this, this effort. So when the next book appears, buy it. <laughs> Yeah, uh, the question, of course, is what nowadays is modern about Fortran? Um, yeah, of course, there are these cosmetic innovations. Uh, um, those of you who know the language know that, in fact, there are two source forms for the language. Uh, the old source form, which basically was attuned to putting all the source code not in a file on the computer, but on two punched cards. Um, and the, the modern one that's used nowadays is the so-called free source one. So, but I would consider that's rather a um, cosmetic innovation in the sense that it's easier to uh, to handle technically. Uh, it's not it's not really something that's strictly uh, a language feature, I see. Yeah, so uh, what I think has actually changed within the language going from Fortran 77 to modern flavors is is the focus. Uh, the original focus of Fortran 77 uh, basically was portability and performance. That, would, I would say, was the essential thing. And it was also, of course, focused mostly on numerical algorithms. Uh, so string processing in Fortran 77 was, while not entirely as nasty as in Fortran 4, uh, was still a chore. Uh, 
Uh, that nowadays has improved, of course, uh, but, uh, but you know, at that point, it, the focus was rather narrow. Uh, nowadays, of course, we still have portability and performance. Uh, um, however, the performance focus has shifted a little bit because, of course, nowadays, uh, one large area of application of the language is actually to run Fortran on scalable HPC systems. Uh, so you have Fortran plus something else to, uh, to, uh, to get good performance. And then uh, these additional items of interoperability, software design and engineering, and optionally resiliency are now coming uh, into play. I will not uh, restrict uh, from mentioning that, of course, to some extent, this is a la mode du jour. Yeah? So the idea of putting resiliency into the language was driven by, by the concept that future supercomputers will have millions of nodes. Um, these years, it has appeared that this not, this, it's not going to be the case for various reasons. But anyway, that's the reason that, why the, this feature was put in. Right. Um, yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll, with this slide, I'd like to give you an overview of uh, new concepts as they appeared in subsequent standard generations after Quartron 77, um, starting with Quartron 90. Uh, we have this concept of a module. Uh, that gives you something like static inheritance uh, and encapsulation, the concept of dynamic data as dealt with by pointers and allocatable objects, um, a type concept, uh, previous languages, uh, language iterations of Fortran only had intrinsic types, numeric types basically, and the character type, the logical type. Uh, but of course, in, in practice, it's very advantageous to be able to also use uh, derived types. Uh, both with plain old data components and dynamic components. Uh, Watch of 90 and 95 were a bit uh, conservative in doing this, so there was some, but there was more progress with this a little bit later on. A big item was, of course, array processing. Um, even then, the idea was to, uh, to enable a parallel processor to, to automatically parallelize array operations, although in practice, uh, this hasn't played a very, very big role, at least not on, on the level of the implementations of the languages. You could, for some machines, drop directives into your code and the compiler would then do parallelization. Uh, also, there exists a construct called for all that also was designed for uh, optimization and parallelization, but it turns out that the semantics uh, is, well, I wrote unimplementable. Uh, at least uh, unimplementable in, the, in, in an efficient way in general. Uh, it, it turned out that in many very relevant situations, you need to create uh, lots of array temporaries for, uh, for dealing with for all construct. Uh, so in fact, in the most recent language iteration, the for all has been made obsolescent and again. It's been replaced by something else. Yeah, in blue, I've marked for additional features that are available uh, for programmers that actually are not inside the Quadrant standard proper. Uh, that's open in P, basically a portable uh, directive co concept for doing shared memory parallelization. And of course, NPI, the message passing interface that allows you to scale out to multiple nodes using a library driven approach. Um, for NPI, I also wrote in crutches because, and, and I'll get to, uh, to to the reason for this uh, as, as we go on later on. So MPI was a bit shaky from the point of view of Fortran for a long time. Yeah, for Fortran 2003, we, um, new concepts appeared like object orientation, uh, IEEE exception handling, and uh, number representations. Uh, C interoperability, basically implementing whatever was possible from C semantics in Quartran, or mapping C semantics to Quartran wherever it was possible. Uh, certain I.O. extensions, um, would, um, and also, of course, um, additional ideas for potential parallelism. Um, I will talk about parameterized uh, data types also a little bit. Um, and also OpenMP at, at about that time when it appeared, it supported additional parallelization concepts like tasking. Yeah, Fortran 2008, um, which actually was published in 2010, um, uh, contained uh, also additional software engineering concepts, uh, something I'll talk about at more length later. And for the first time, an, ex an explicit parallel programming model, um, namely co-arrays. And I'll also mention that later, so I'm not going to deal with this here. Uh, 
and also do concurrent as a replacement for for all. Yeah, furthermore, um, OpenMP was extended and also MPI was extended. MPI is still with crutches. Yeah, the current edition of the standard, the current TLA valid standard is brought from 2018, actually published in 2018. Uh, and uh, that contained additional C interoperability features, uh, the development of which was driven by, um, among others, the MPI forum, uh, because the MPI forum wanted to get rid of the crutches and allow Fortran guys to write standard conforming code uh, and, and code that did not change its properties whenever a new compiler with better optimization came along. Um, yeah, so there was a sort of uh, with pressure on the committee to uh, to do this stuff. Basically, it allows it allowed you to express certain Fortran semantics aspects in C. Now, so it's in the inverse of, of what already was there. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this as we go along. Furthermore, uh, there are more parallel features um, underlying the core array concept in Fortran 2018. Um, collective intrinsics, atomic intrinsics, events, teams, and, and all this stuff. So I'll explain a little bit of this uh, later on. Yeah, um, OpenMP and NPI again have been extended, and now um, uh, um, looking at it, 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 it always causes me to step back a bit because it's become it's become so monstrous that no one can learn all this stuff anymore. Yeah. And the MPI standard, I think, has exceeded 900 pages by now. Uh, the OpenMP standard, I think, is also quite big and fat, um, and uh, it, it covers not only a threading programming model, but three or four other programming models as well. Um, yeah, so that yeah, causes a certain amount of tummy ache. Uh, what to learn from this stuff and what to uh, learn to use productively. Compared to this, the Fortran standard has been reasonably slow in growth. So it's around 600 pages. I think. Yeah. yeah, right. So that was an overview of the sort of main feature list. So, of course, I can't speak about all of this in, 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 in a talk uh, like this. But I would like to highlight a couple of topics that uh, seem to me to be sort of illustrating what the advances uh, in general were. And the first one is um, the concept of dependency inversion. Um, it's a software design and engineering aspect. So let's perhaps first focus on the left half of this diagram here. That's basically Fortran 95 or Fortran 90. You have a module, uh, you write some procedures in the module, and then these can be used in other programs via what's called use association. Uh, that's the static inheritance model that I mentioned. And um, uh, so far, so good. Yeah? But now, if you write a sort of central, centrally important module that's used by many, many other program units, and you need to make a change to it, you need to recompile all the other program units because they depend on this module in some way. So, because if you change something that changes uh, the internal structures of your specifications, uh, you would become binary incompatible. And for large program packages, this mean, uh, means that it, you may be compiling for hours or days on this stuff. Yeah? So that's a, this certain, a, certainly a disadvantage. Modern compiler technology, technology by using module information files in an appropriate way can circumvent this, of course. Um, however, there are still situations where uh, this doesn't help. Uh, and I will get to that uh, on the next slide. In any case, uh, to solve this problem, um, the concept of a submodule was introduced that basically allows you to separate the interface of module procedures from the actual implementation. So basically what you, what you write is a separate program unit where you put the executable statements and the local declarations and whatever um, of your procedures. And that has access to the parent module by what's called host association. Uh, so it also gains access to private entities, for example, in that module. Um, and anything other, in fact, you can put lots of stuff in a submodule. You, know, you can also put specifications into a submodule. And anything you put there that doesn't have an interface in the parent module is basically private. You know? So that's, that's, it's invisible to, to the outside world. <clears throat> so what you basically get at this point is, is uh, what's called a structural dependency inversion because uh, your program units that depend on the module do not depend on 
on this stuff in the submodule. So you can, as long as you don't need to make any changes in specifications here, you don't need to recompile dependent program units. Uh, that's why it's called dependency inversion, uh, because you get, can get rid of these unnecessary uh, uh, seeming dependencies, which are not real, real dependencies at all. In fact, you can iterate this kind of concept, so you can have submodules or submodules and so on. Uh, that's possible. Uh, it's probably of limited usefulness, uh, but it's the language permits it. Right, so that's number one. Basically, it's this, this first item has to do with how you organize your source code. Uh, the second one is um, actually a semantic dependency inversion pattern. And those of you who, who do object orientation, I assume there's no one here who doesn't know about this. Uh, I'm talking about interface classes here, and these are supported in Fortran because Fortran has this concept of single inheritance. So you can start out with an abstract type uh, and define an interface for that abstract type, which I've denoted with open here. And uh, then you have concrete implementations of this um, where you're obliged to overload or to extend your uh, open procedure by a real implementation of the open procedure. Um, so I've indicated this by a sort of uh, you know, UML-like diagram with this inheritance symbol here. Um, yeah. And how do you use this stuff in, 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 in client code? You can create an object, a polymorphic object, that's obligatory more or less in this situation. Um, and then perform an auto allocation of this object to the desired actual dynamic type, one time type, and then invoke a, a virtual method on it, uh, which will then dynamically, depending on the actual object of that type, call the right procedure, uh, the actually implemented procedure. Yeah, so the idea here is you achieve semantic dependency inversion because uh, your program code will only always reference uh, this abstract type and its, fe its uh, features. Uh, there is no explicit reference to any uh, to any extended type here. Um, so that's how you get this semantic dependency inversion through interface classes. Right, so um, now life could be nice. You have, a, you have a, an abstract concept, you write millions of virtual methods, and then you could argue, okay, my program is only going to, to, to use this abstract uh, features and anything else goes into other modules that use this module, do their type extension and so on. It would be nice if it were that easy, but the devil is in the detail and uh, I've hidden it between this in this assignment where the object must be created. Okay, That's the point where things go wrong. The creation of the polymorphic object. Uh, the question, of course, is how do I do that and where do, do, do I do that? Well, the language does not permit you to do that through a virtual method. Um, and the reason is quite simple. It's, it's not possible on the language level itself, but there's, of course, there's a good reason behind this because uh, the uh, virtual method needs the dynamic type of the object and you don't know that yet because it hasn't been created yet. <laughs> so, yeah, pen and egg. Yeah. And the other question is, of course, where do I create the polymorphic object? Well. Um, the client code needs access, so, it's, so the location of this definition must be in the module that defines the abstract programming interface. Otherwise, uh, the programs that use this stuff will not be able to use the, the creation of procedure. Yeah, um, so what you, what you can do in Fortran, of course, is to have a function that returns you such a polymorphic uh, object. Um, but of course, at some point, the implementation will need to make a decision on what specific type this object should be. Yeah? So it needs to do what's called a typed allocation. It might also be a source allocation, whatever. Yeah? Uh, at this point, you run into trouble because uh, you need to access, you need to use access um, the extended type um, to be able to, to enable the compiler to know what file handle it is. Yeah? So you need a separate use statement for that. And at this point, you run into trouble because, of course, uh, give, oops, that was wrong. Sorry. Um, because at this point, 
um, we get a, what's called a circular use association. Yeah? So on one hand, the, far, the extended type leads to, uh, the module containing the extended type leads to use the module containing the abstract type. On the other hand, the procedure that creates the object must reside here and it needs to use the extended module as well. And well, uh, circular use associations are not allowed in Fortran for good reason, because you can easily create inconsistent, uh, inconsistent environments like that. Mm -hmm. So your module dependency graph needs to be a direct isentric graph. And that's uh, where uh, now again, uh, submodules come in, come in because they allow you to break such circular uh, use associations. So if, what you simply do is to create an interface that creates this, uh, that creates your polymorphic object. And this interface has no reference at all to any type extension. So it's, it's, a, it's only references whatever is already defined in, in, in my abstract module. Um, the only place where you actually need to access uh, the type extensions is in the implementation. Uh, so the implementation needs to make use of this, uh, of any extension type module that you have de uh, defined. Um, so you get this diagram that allows you to combine structural and semantic depend dependency inversion to, to have a clean design. Yeah. Uh, one thing that, uh, that is remarkable, of course, is that uh, you end up having an indirect use association and uh, the host association in parallel. Yeah? And that's of course can cause trouble because use association overrides host association. Uh, so if you simply do a use on this uh, um, along this path, you will also try to use stuff inside the mod handle, inside the abstract module. Uh, this may cause side effects because uh, because entities that are uh, that are private here. May become inaccessible then, yeah. uh, while through host association they would be accessible, but the use association overrides host association. So it's a good idea to use only clauses on the use on use statements inside the submodule to avoid such side effects. Uh, I should, by the way, uh, comment that uh, in the original submodule design, indirect uh, use associations were not permitted, um, and it, it was a bit of a fight to to. to get that permitted, but there are uh, substantial reasons why it should be, uh, because there are lots of situations where you end up um, with uh, with such an indirect use association in the course of developing your program code. So if, if you some, suddenly, don't, if you don't permit it, you need to write lots and lots and lots of glue code to get around the situation. And for this reason, uh, it's a good, a good idea to have this in. So this is the concept of dependency inversion. Now let's go on to another concept that's of importance, parallelism. I already mentioned these additional um, programming models outside the standards that are supported, OpenMP and message passing. And I will discuss a little bit um, um, the, the issue of having standard conforming code in Fortran when using MPI. Uh, within the standard, uh, of course, there are two models, the core arrays I already mentioned, and also compiler-driven parallelism uh, via the do concurrent construct that actually is hardware independent. Uh, so it's the semantics is defined in such a way that that it simply uh, 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 hints by the programmer to the compiler that all your loop iterations are independent of each other. And then the compiler can do whatever it wants with it. Yeah? It could it could, for example, drive an accelerator or an external system somehow via, via do concurrent. It's implementation dependent how it implements this. Right, so let's go to the topic of uh, MPI and standards conformance. Uh, before I actually uh, do so, let me set the stage by ha having a short um, illustration of the concept of asynchronous processing. Um, yeah, so let's again look at the left half here first. So basically you have a, a sort of workflow, computing an array, and then you need to dump it, for example, to a to a memory or to a storage device, whatever, that could be anything. Um, and after that, you would compute B, perhaps using A. And finally, you would go, go on to update A because this whole stuff might be processed in a loop. Or something, yeah? And now, of course, looking at this, uh, this stuff, um, one could easily imagine how to save time by, uh, by um, overlapping computation of B with a dumping of A here, 
You can do that conceptually at the same time without interfering with the correctness of the algorithm. And um, this concept, in fact, is was available in Fortran starting with Fortran 2003, at least in principle. Um, and it, so it permitted you to um, basically at, at some point start a second indep independent instruction sequence. This is called initiation of asynchronous processing. And then you could overlap these two activities of dumping data as well as calculating other stuff from the data. Um, yeah, the only thing that was important, of course, is before you then update A again, you need to uh, make sure that the second instruction string has completed. Otherwise, uh, you will start dumping data that has already been updated later on. So you get an inconsistency in the data. So you need what's called a completion procedure, uh, which is typically called wait. Yeah? There exists an explicit wait state between Fortran and there are others, as we shall see. Um, and the, the data item involved in this is called the affector. Uh, that's the data items that somehow are affected by asynchronous processing. Yeah, whether or not you save times with such a procedure is a different matter because it's, it's implementation dependent. You can imagine uh, that uh, if not sufficiently hardware resources are available to do this stuff, you might not save a lot of time. And of course, there are sometimes situations where the optimizer is so good in in interleaving operations here um, that that you might not you might actually not spend as much time with the update of a uh, as you expect so that actually save time much might may be shorter yeah? because um, if you have this prescription of not touching uh, stuff before the wait has done there's no possibility of of, of interleaving operations here for the compiler uh, which may be still possible for the optimizers. Um, um, right, so that's uh, that, that's the concept of asynchronous processing. Now, within Fortran 2003, the only scenario where this was actually permitted was with I/O, yeah, with write and read statements and all this stuff, but uh, not otherwise. On the other hand, you had in MPI, the message passing interface, this concept of performing non-blocking write operations. So basically, again, dumping data. Yeah? So um, you would then uh, um, basically start your non-blocking operation by an MPI I send to send out some buffer and immediately return. At least the idea is that this call immediately returns yeah? and as a separate processing facility to asynchronously deal with the transfers of A to MPI from MPI rank zero to MPI rank one, where you call a corresponding receive. And then you could do some, some stuff uh, that does not somehow modify the buffer. Huh? And then uh, finally, again, you would have an MPI specific weight, MPI underscore weight, that takes the request handle generated by the MPI I send and, and makes sure that the instruction stream uh, that's running asynchronously to dump A to MPI rank one is completed before it actually uh, allows it to continue after the MPI weight. So that's the MPI concept. Huh? So far, so bad. Um, yeah, one thing, of course, is that uh, even nowadays, the MPI standard says that the implementation is not obliged to overlap communication and computation. Yeah? So it could have non-blocking semantics without actually doing any optimization. You know? it, it might still uh, effectively work synchronously. And the consequence is that uh, lots of bad things can happen, and maybe they only happen a little bit further down the road. Yeah? So one is that a race condition appears mysteriously um, with a new and improved compiler and MPI implementation. Yeah? The implementation may do more efficient progress, and the compiler may, may move operations done on the buffer um, uh, with optimizers code motion to become for before the API wait statement because the API wait statement does not involve the buffer at all. Uh, the compiler does not necessarily have knowledge about this. Well, it might be clever, yeah, but there's no direct way for the compiler to set up this relationship between the request handle and the buffer. buffer. Yeah, the second thing is that uh, as a photo programmer, you like using array syntax. So you said, okay, I want to send my array, my array sections uh, through this routine, uh, and then you fall over. <laughs> it doesn't do what you expect. Typically, you run into segmentation faults. And the reason for this is simply that API I send expects a contiguous buffer. 
And if you send when if you send in a discontinuous buffer, it will simply do it will simply create a contiguous copy. Uh, pro start processing with that, and uh, since MPIs send, send returns, this contiguous copy will simply be sold into thin air while it's still being processed, which is not what you want. Okay, so that's uh, that's that's of course a problem. And while we are at it, uh, none of the MPI calls with buffers, and there are lots of them because buffers is what MPI deals with is type safe. No? MPI buffers um, in the API interface are can be expected to be of any type and rank. But Fortran does not really have a concept for this up to Fortran 2008. Yeah. So what do you, do you need to do? You can either you can make the uh, um, API module file very slim and do no checking at all using implicit interfaces at this point, which is not really what you want because the idea of having modules is that the compiler can check the use of your interface against its definition. Yeah. So it finds programming errors that are uh, that are due to mismatched types, mismatched ranks, and so on. Um, yeah, and so that's so basically what you couldn't have is a standard conforming MPI interface. The crutches I mentioned earlier basically consist in those compiler directives to perhaps ignore the type of a buffer. Uh, typically, I think it affects the complete signature. So it's even if you have an interface in your MPI module, it's not worth much. Um, yeah, to avoid code motion, there was the so-called volatile app attribute, which absolutely destroyed any performance of operations, local operations in buffer, because uh, it, it basically is like a flush in every line of your code, and a flush in every line of the code. And um, also, there exists a, a, in the MPI standard there exists an MPI F sync rank that you can place. Um, um, I think immediately after the MPI wait to make sure that this, these movements, the code movements by the optimizer don't happen. Uh, so, so that's uh, need all the crutches. Uh, it's not very pretty. And there's no solution at all for the array slice issue. Yeah, so this uh, was achieved by these new C interoperability uh, features uh, in Fractal 2018. Uh, it was achieved that you can uh, get around these problems. Yeah. Uh, so there exists a new interface module that has slightly different definitions. Uh, some improvements are that various uh, objects actually get their own derived types now. That improves the overall type safety of the interface because there can be no mix up of different integer parameters anymore. Um, yeah, and 2000, uh, 2018 also extended the use of the asynchronous attribute to also permit um, all bait in a still implementation dependent manner that's not only IO but also other procedures, procedure calls could be um, uh, initiation of or, or, or completion procedures. In this case, MPI I send and MPI wait. So, that, uh, so that's uh, what you get here. Yeah? Um, if you look at the MPI interface, uh, you will see that, that 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 there are two new items in the declaration of a buffer in the MPI interface. One is that the type specification is with a star, which may basically is the same as C star void from from a point of view of the type. It can be of any type essentially. The, the actual argument can be of any type. Um, of course, the buffer argument is also asynchronous, and then it's also declared with what's called assumed rank, which means it could be a scalar or an array of any rank that Fortran supports. Uh, so you get rid of the problem that uh, that uh, there is no uh, there, there is no proper type checking in the interface itself. I'm not checking all the other arguments. Um, of course, this is of course a big kitchen sink, uh, quite clearly. But that's the, the dedicated purpose here. Um, the type checking is done in the interface itself anyway, because you need to transmit the type of your MPI object through a separate argument. So that's uh, that's covered. Yeah, and the assumed rank, as we shall see, basically allows you uh, to now also sense derived arrays. And I'll get to this, of course. Simply writing this uh, is is syntax, uh, but the machinery behind this is a little bit more complicated. Um, to make sure, by the way, the MPI standard also provides a logical variable uh, which indicates whether or not uh, the Fortran compiler supports this properly. Yeah, not, all, not all compilers do. Yeah, 
So let's turn to the machinery behind assumed rank. Um, to, for explanation of this, I will assume that NPI I set actually has an interoperable interface. So it's been marked by C. In practice, this may not be the case, but let's forget that for now. Yeah? Uh, so in this case, uh, the implementation of this stuff would be possibly in, in, um, in C. And uh, what you basically what arrives on the C side is then a special object of a of a type called a descriptor type CFI underscore C disk underscore T. Um, that type as well as its API are defined in in a, a ISO ISO fraudulent binding H file that is specific to a fraudulent implementation, of course. Yeah. So you're, what you only get is um, at this point is source level compatibility, not binary level compatibility. Yeah. So a given C file can only bind to a specific Fortran process. Yeah, this uh, C descriptor for a Fortran object is rather complicated, and I'm not going to explain all details. But basically, what you get is, is a sort of base address, which po points to the memory pool that's used by the Fortran object. Uh, you get information about the array structure, for example, the rank, and also the, the extent and, and sprite multipliers of the various dimensions. Um, I'm, not, I'm not going to go into the details, but from the two drawings on the right-hand side, um, you can sort of see the general idea here that it allows you to, try to transmit either contiguous or non-contiguous objects through the interface. Uh, um, of course, on the C side, you expose uh, more stuff than on the Fortran side, in a sense, because uh, if you have your memory pool, uh, you will also have lots of memory cells in this contiguous object that you are not allowed to touch uh, because they are not part of the object proper. But the, since the objects, the, the parts of the object are sort of distributed in this memory pool for discontiguous array sections, there is no other way to get at it from the C point of view than, uh, than doing it this way. Uh, so, um, yeah. So that's that's how it's done. Um, quite generally, by the way, this there's an API which I'm not going to explain in detail here that allows you to also create and manipulate such uh, C descriptors. Um, in this situation, you don't need to do that because you get it as a present from the Fortran processor anywhere. But there are, there's also the option of creating within C Fortran like objects, and uh, it's mostly for that purpose that the, the API is designed. Yeah, so this gives you also an impression of how you could implement Fortran NPI ISEND in terms of C large cap NPI ISEND. Um, so, uh, so basically, if, you, if it turns out that your bus buffer is contiguous, you can simply send all the stuff directly on. Uh, you simply uh, start with the base address of the original Fortran object. We have a contiguous memory, all is fine. You can do whatever has been requested. If it's not contiguous, the situation is a little bit more complicated because then uh, uh, the API interface offers you simply the option to create a descriptor, uh, an API descriptor for a discontiguous object. So uh, the idea is simply here that the Fortran, uh, the C descriptor for the Fortran object contains enough information to allow you to construct a discontiguous API object and then process that uh, through this discontinu discontiguous MPI type. So, uh, basically, that's already what you typically needed to do in Fortran, as long as those array subsections were not supported. Uh, so one could, of course, argue, well, uh, why this complication? It, it shifts the work from the uh, programmer to the implementer of the API interface. Uh, that's what's done, effectively done. Here. Yeah, so that's that's the machine. And so that's what that was the illustration of why this extended C interoperability stuff was added to the language, uh, mostly driven by API. Yeah, for, uh, let's go back to uh, parallel model within Quartran itself. Um, the for parallel model within Quartran itself is a SPMD like programming model. So in that in that uh, aspect, it's related to MPI, which has the same thing. Um, instead of MPI ranks, you have the concept of an image, but otherwise it's the same thing. Each image has its own data set data uh, as an MPI. Um, of course, sometimes you will be obliged in a parallel program to transmit certain data from one image to the other image. And that in turn is only possible if you add another attribute to such a data object to make it communicable. Uh, um, so that's 
that's the only difference between A and B. Yeah? A is communicable, B is not communicable, but the, the memory layout is essentially uh, the same. Yeah? Well, uh, communicable memory is typically put in what's called the symmetric heap. Uh, so the requirement on communicable data is that they need to have the same size on all on each image. Uh, this is not the case necessarily for non-communicable objects. So, well, here's a static object, but allocatable objects can of course have a different size on each image if they are not communicable. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, then there's, of course, a syntax that allows you to pull and push data. It's basically a one-sided communication mechanism. Uh, and also, there's the obligation of the programmer to put synchronization statements to avoid race conditions. Yeah? So to avoid a race condition between the definition of some bar uh, of, of a co-array co variable and its reference on a different image, you need such a synchronization statement. One of those is a global barrier, but there are others uh, for example, events that allow you to do uh, the coordination only between two specific images instead of all images. Uh, this is called segment ordering in Quadran. Uh, so segments of one image can be ordered on against segments on other images to assure that no race conditions. Will be. So that's the sort of baseline uh, model here, and. Um, um, the first compiler that actually implemented the stuff before it was even understandable was Cray compiler, uh, but Cray, of course, had very good network hardware that properly supported this sort of stuff. Uh, there's a lot of headroom for implementation improvements in, uh, in compilers that use this on regular systems with infinity band or so. You know, so that's, uh, the implementations are not terribly efficient nowadays with respect to, or, to network performance. I, yeah. Can you give any comment whether there is a future for that? Because it was strongly pushed by Cray, and Cray now is a part of HPE, and we all know what happened to innovative companies being purchased by yeah. larger business companies. Yeah. Well, um, I'm still hoping for it. <laughs> I mean, there are uh, basically you have PIGAS like concepts in MPI nowadays also because the memory model of MPI has been significantly improved to cover this case as well. And many of the implementations actually use MPI under the hoods. Uh, so uh, I hope this is going to still significantly improve over the next years. Yeah, um, extensions for uh, in Fortran uh, 2018 for core arrays. Uh, the most important one I want to mention here as well is the concept of teams. Um, the baseline core array model basically is flat. Yeah? So you have your st you start 100 images and distribute the data among your 100 images and process them. Uh, but it's not uncommon that uh, that you have a very large, if you have a very large programming effort and uh, and both and you have sort of two groups of people doing work on different kinds of code. Uh, for example, one group doing work on the fluid code and, and another group doing work on the structure code. Both use core arrays, yeah, and uh, the question is, how do you bring those two together if fluid and structure interact in some manner? Um, with a flat model, it's nearly impossible because you need to rely on conventions, how to uh, how to apportion resources in or images to the various parts of the code, and that's really very difficult to handle. Uh, so basically, the co concept of core array teams allows you to compose parallel programs by simply breaking up your large set of images into equip into disjoint subsets that can execute independently of each other. Uh, and in fact, you can set up then core arrays instead of on a, on a um, um, worldwide basis on, on a team-wide basis. Uh, so you can actually have core arrays uh, on one team that do not exist on the other team and vice versa. And that, of course, allows you to now uh, have minimal communication between your two groups of programmers. They only need to consistently deal with their own code. And perhaps to some extent where they need to communicate is when you need to exchange data between, between the two codes. Uh, you need to define an interface for that, of course. But that's possible. And there exists, in fact, also syntax uh, in the language to, to deal with the idea that uh, data from one a team might be needed on the other one. Yeah. This, of course, uh, requires that uh, you use core arrays that are defined before you actually enter your team execution uh, context. Yeah, so 
basically, that's the idea here. And uh, there are not only, this is not the only the idea of having um, uh, NPMD style parallelism, but there are also, also some other scenarios that could be covered by teams. Uh, for example, you could consider a kind of hybrid model. Yeah? For example, one idea might be, okay, for the sake of the better latencies and bandwidths, uh, you can say, okay, I'm going to do team execution inside a shared memory node um, and, and run stuff there that does lots of communication and that do not try not to have any communication across node boundaries uh, for efficiency reasons. Uh, another scenario that's con con that can be considered is if you have divide and conquer algorithms uh, to do a recursive team decomposition until your data sets are suitable for uh, for a baseline algorithm. Yeah, and a third usage scenario for teams actually is connected with the resiliency feature. Um, where the resiliency feature is, of course, optional in the standards, so there's no guarantee that an implementer supports it, but the basic idea is to continue execution of, uh, of images in the face of partial hardware failure. So if one node of your computation fails, fails, a few images will drop away, of course, but the others on other nodes that are still good will be able to continue. And it's it's possible, and it was that was sort of demonstrated for the feature also during the language development is uh, to say, okay, I'm going to start out um, with a, a set of images and define as uh, decompose that set of images into a team, one large team doing the work, and a small team containing spare images. And when something fails. Uh, you you pull out a spare image and, and create a new team execution context with the same number of images as before. Um, and that would allow the programmer uh, to implement resilient applications. Unfortunately, the programming effort is significant. Yeah? So if you have already a parallel code basis, it, 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 it typically needs significant reworking of parallel library components because you, at every synchronization point, you need to add a query, has this been successful? Uh, and then act appropriately. Yeah, I see a couple of uh, entries in the chat. Oh, yeah, that's not that was before. So we can have questions later on. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's of course uh, looking at all that, looking at the situation, uh, you of course potentially end up with. Uh, with uh, combining uh, parallel programming models. I already mentioned that uh, uh, communication in core array programs is not very efficient. Another aspect here is that you typically uh, start out with an existing MPI program with many billions lines of code and you simply don't have the time to rework all this to core array code. Uh, so the baseline idea is of course, if you already have MPI code and want to extend this somehow, it is certainly permitted to, to also use core arrays Provided you properly separate the synchronization properties of the MPI code from the synchronization properties of the core array code somehow to avoid deadlocks, which can of course happen if you do synchronizations in, in an inadequate manner. And um, yeah, so, uh, unfortunately, you, you need at quite early in your program design, you need to make a choice what kind of model you use because there, there are various possibilities. The most common one probably is to say, okay, um, um, uh, I'm, I'm simply have a one-to-one -one model. So a core array image is equivalent to an MPI task apart from the numbering of ranks versus images, which is zero based versus one based. Uh, and that typically works with existing implementations. Um, they use MPI anyway under the hood. So they basically use the rank number as the image number with an offset of one. On the other hand, it's also possible to, uh, to uh, have Consider nested models. Yeah, so you might start out with um, with uh, core arrays and then create a hybrid where uh, each core array image starts its own NPI com world. Yeah? That's certainly feasible in principle. Um, um, uh, whether you want that is a program is a question. Yeah? Uh, more commonly, probably, it's is to actually have a hybrid setup where you start opening P threads within a core array or a PI image. Uh, that's probably also easier to handle. One problem that generally uh, you have here is, of course, that neither the API standard nor the OpenMP standard have proper support for core arrays. So 
they neither really describes what how the interaction of core arrays with their own parallel features are. OpenMP nowadays uh, has some few sentences about core array, but mostly of a nature. Uh, this will not work. Uh, or this, this the results are implementation dependent, so it's not really helpful. Um, yeah. Yeah, I have a real remark here on what the state of the implementations uh, implementation is. I don't think I know to need to go through these uh, in detail. Uh, one interesting case is the NAC compiler because uh, that's it's the only implementation that's uh, that only offers shared memory support, uh, at least the only mature implementation that only offers shared memory support uh, as an exclusive alternative to NAC NAC's OpenMP implementation. Um, yeah. And you'll also see that there exist uh, two compilers that, or three compilers that also even support resiliency. From the Mac compiler, it's only semantics because, of course, failure of a shared memory node, that's not helpful. Uh, there exists a statement, by the way, to simulate a failure of an image. So you can actually, as a programmer, you can invoke a failure of an image and that allows you to do testing of uh, resilience features in your code. Yeah, so this is what I had to say about parallelism and its interaction of various parallel features. Another topic um, that is a sort of hidden treasure of, of object-based programming is the concept of parameterized data types. These actually were already introduced in Fortran 2003, um, a long time ago. Fortran 2003 was published in 2004, and it was only a few years later that the concept of Arrays of structures versus structure of arrays came into focus due to accelerators mostly. Uh, and uh, now we see that this concept has already been in Fortran for a significant amount of time. Uh, so instead of having um, a simple type with scalar or, or small array components, you can fold an array component into the type definition, basically being able to work with very large arrays as, as type components in a very flexible manner. And um, this is, of course, uh, this is basically allows you to uh, perform certain certain operations very efficiently um, with parameterized derived data types, which is not possible with arrays of structures. Specifically, contiguous access to memory when processing your data, and therefore you can vectorize stuff or you can easily offload stuff to an accelerator without lose, losing spatial locality. Uh, um, so, uh, so that's, that's the basic idea here. And, um, and looking at this, uh, for even for reasonably old compilers now, I did this a few years ago, two or three years ago, uh, you see a significant performance difference with basically stemming from the auto like vectorization working or not working, uh, with, with arrays of structures versus structures of arrays. So even, even for G4Tron, you get a significant performance boost here. Um, yeah, so this is something that's not uh, used too often in, in production codes nowadays. Um, um, but in fact, it's get, it, it gets even a little bit better than that, because uh, it turns out that this concept of parameterized derived types carries over uh, in efficient use for core arrays as well. Um, well, as an alternative to using parameterized derived types, you could of course, also use uh, regular derived types with allocatable components. That's certainly an option as long as you do serial programming because, uh, because um, vectorization works on those type components if you allocate your stuff at runtime. And implementations of this, con this concept is more mature than for the parameterized derived types. So you're less likely to run into compiler bugs. Um, however, um, um, for for this more simpler concept of user allocatable components, um, the, um, the use as core array is rather limited. Uh, uh, this is different with a parameterized type. Uh, you get symmetric memory automatically, and you should get efficient access, um, uh, at least with a good implementation, with an efficient implementation, you should get uh, efficient access also on across the network for your uh, contiguous memory areas. So you can copy complete blocks of memory from one image to another. And that's more efficient than trying this with allocatable components, which may be of different size on each image. And therefore, the implementation has an additional latency of querying the size 
of the memory block to be copied before it can actually do the copy. Yeah. Uh, so here again, uh, I, I have a amount of hope that this might be something that can be put to good use once the implementations are appropriately lightened. Yeah, so this uh, completes the illustration of features in the current language that can be considered modern. Um, let's go on to Fortran futures. I still have two slides on that. Uh, yeah, the Fortran Standards Committee will release a new edition of the standard probably next year. And the current one is in uh, has is in this stage, having draft for international standard stage. So it's currently being voted on. But I expect that there will should be no big difficulties here. Uh, even in the CD stage, there were there, there, there were not that many comments. So I will. Uh, I would expect that this will, will go through and be published next year. Um, I, I put a, out a list of, of features in here. There are some more, there's some more core array stuff. There are there's some more stuff on do concurrent. So you can put reductions on do concurrent, which wasn't possible up to now. Um, there exists a concept of a simple procedure, uh, which is even a little bit more restricted than a pure procedure. Uh, pure procedures in Quartran are basically side effect free procedures. But there, can, there are certain things that pure procedures still can do, like referencing global, global variables that are also uh, not permitted with simple procedures. Yeah. Uh, there's some extension to array syntax, which is of interest. So you can do what's called multi subscripts. Uh, currently, in Fortran subscripts are scalar triplets, uh, and you go on to array triplets, so to speak. And this allows you to do more powerful stuff with arrays. Um, another interesting thing is conditional expressions. So the stuff you have in C or C++ with condition, uh, question, and then you have alternative one and alternative two. Uh, and that allows you to write in, in very complex decision trees. It allows you to, to sim considerably simplify your source code. Because for example, if you uh, call, uh, if you have a lo uh, lots of isted ifs and thens, and you need to write 100 calls to a single procedure with different arguments, that can be considerably simplified using such conditional expressions. Uh, the Fortran committee went into overkill with enumeration types, in my opinion. So there exists two variants of this one interoperable and a more extended semantics, uh, which, however, is not interoperable with C. Yeah, so that's basically the most important stuff in that you can expect for the next iteration. Uh, after that, uh, there's already now going on the collection of features for the for, for the Fortran standard. We can probably expect near the end of the decade, um, so 2028, hopefully. We'll see. Uh, the most important feature, which actually is already decided, uh, we want uh, we want to have generic programming in Fortran as well. And the current idea, the most advanced idea with that, that, that already is under active development and is most likely to actually happen is to have templates. Uh, there are some different to difference to C++ templates. So the idea is to not permit meta programming. Uh, that's, not, that's off the table. Um, uh, but otherwise it's very flexible. You can have nested stuff and uh, typically you will write you will write additional constraints on parameters like a template needs certain operations between parameters as restrictions. So there exists a separate syntax for formulating restrictions. The further features are still under consideration, and I put a link into the, into the PDF. Um, um, yeah, someone of you, I think I'll send the PDF to Georg and kind of trigger that then. So uh, I'm not going to discuss these. There's a long, long list of stuff. Not all of this will be done, of course, because it needs to be processed and filtered and condensed by the committee. Uh, I put in two items because I suggested it myself, <laughs> uh, but uh, well, at least part of them myself. Uh, but it's still a discussion, so I can't can't really comment on that yet. Yeah, and to come to the uh, to the end of my talk, I, uh, the attempt to answer the question from the cover page. My personal answer is, um, is that a contradiction in itself, modern Fortran, and I would say no, due to the evolution of the language um, and relevant software and engineering concepts being added, I think it can be considered a modern language. Um, the use, the programmer is of course obliged to use best practices to avoid problematic legacy features. The second question of future, future proofness um, is perhaps more doubtful 
performance uh, possibility is also for Fortran becoming a significant problem. Um, and there's currently in the language, there is no real support for accelerated hardware, at least not dedicated support, apart from this rather generic current stuff. So I would say maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, by the way, future is also a technical term. Uh, uh, um, one, one possible idea with illustrated with fantasy syntax is that you could, uh, of course, support accelerators by having a procedure call and doing that asynchronously. Uh, and you would have some ID for the rate and some device to, to send your data to and then do your processing like this. Uh, this has been discussed at some, at some points in the Fortran committee, but it has not yet materialized in actual development of our feature. So, thank you very much. I hope you uh, didn't, it wasn't uh, a too much of a chore because it was a rather long talk, but uh, I think uh, thank, you. thank you, Reinhold. So, looking at your slides and your talk and the development skills and the future perspectives and plans, this reminds me of building a, a computing center. So, the computing center should be future proof, but you know from your own experience, one, once it's built, it's old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so, you have the same challenges in, in the Fortran. Uh, committee. So are there any questions or open points discussion? Um, I was wondering uh, about the uh, templates. So uh, I think most of us know that uh, templates in C++ are suboptimal. Uh, they lead to lots of errors and uh, is from my observation. So uh, has this been taken in consideration? Um, and uh, has this been uh, a point of, of uh, some correction here to avoid this in Fortran? Yeah, well, um, to, to repeat the question, the question is whether uh, the mistakes done with the C++ templates uh, are repeated or not repeated in the Fortran development templates. Um, I already mentioned that um, um, if, if there are relationships between template parameters, uh, these can be made explicit in Fortran via a restriction. And that should avoid, I think, this problem. It's similar to concepts in, in C++. Um, I think concepts now, now also have been added to the C++ standard, but I don't know whether they fully solve the problem. So that's uh, not known to me. And correspondingly, it would be the same here. The guy developing a template needs to probably make explicitly make sure that, uh, that, uh, that he avoids this problem. Uh, but I must admit, since no implementations exist, and there exist a couple of examples, and the concept has not been fully defined yet, uh, I probably cannot really do justice to it yet. So, but the idea is, of course, to avoid these problems. Yeah, that's, it's, this has been part of the discussions. I would like to give the audience uh, the opportunity to raise hand and say, uh, and give an idea to Reinhold, he's a member of the standard committee. What should be in the next standard? <laughs> which which will be published hopefully when we get our new computer set. <laughs> so are there any ideas what should be supported by the next Fortran standard? Because you can only uh, 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 make suggestions if you know enough about the existing Fortran yeah. standard. <laughs> Sorry? GPUs. GPI yeah. GPU model. I, I, I would agree, yeah. but, but you probably only need that, if, even if it's, of course, a, a ticklish topic because of, of the great variety of potential GPU advisors that you can consider. In, so it's, it's, that's one of the reasons they didn't add this stuff, because there were a number of suggestions by various members, and they always said, uh, we think that's, this is not going to be portable enough. And so yeah. Yeah. In, in what style, like in the like open ACC annotations or like a um, concurrent do or do, do concurrent would do concurrent nowadays already has the semantics, but of course it's only one of many possible constants. And I think I think Nvidia already implements something like how they think yeah things should uh, should, should go, but um, I think it's not a standardized thing or, or the well, it, do concurrent it, probably says um yeah do, do concurrent simply says the, 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 the it's a promise by the programmer that yeah. the iterations are independent and therefore yeah. you can 
independently execute them in different parts of your hardware. Okay, so then it's just a question of the implementer, right? Yes, in Padoot concurrent, yes. But do concurrent, of course, is limited in scope. It's 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 not always a solution. Mm -hmm. Witness open and tasking. I would I would, for example, consider uh, something like tasking in combination with potential upload mechanisms that are sufficiently portable as a as a good candidate, but mm -hmm. it's not in the language yet. So I think um there's a bit of a um a contradiction here, a bit of a contradiction and uh, Two, two, two uh, problems that uh, kind of aren't really uh, possible to solve at the same time. So one, one hand, of course, um, me as a programmer, I think everyone wants a good orthogonal model that is applicable to everything. But when I look at um, Buddha or uh, Physical or whatever, um, what I see is an extreme hardware dependence of performance. Uh, like in, in CUDA, I have to uh, even use things like um, check if uh, I do concurrent uh, memory access in the same bank, memory bank, or a different memory bank, and um, I don't know, low level crap like that. So it's easy, it's quite flat. <laughs> and, um, yes. Of course, that's a level of, of complexity that ideally would uh, not be part of the language, but the question is, is that even possible with? Uh, Current hardware, uh, current hardware programming models. That I don't know. Yeah, neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so more questions? Yeah, maybe one general question. I think on slide 24, you had uh, graphs with performance data. And there, yeah, this one. Uh, and you can clearly see that the Intel compiler is much better here. Uh, yeah. yeah. First of all, do you know why? And then do you have like a general um, or like a rule of thumb, should we always use Intel compiler for it's, well, code? it's, it's Intel compiler on Intel hardware. So yeah, you typically get best best vectorization for the Intel compiler. Yeah. That's the main reason. Yeah. Um, and also, as you see, um, even for the baseline um, um, array of structures, you get a much better performance than G quad from here. So I, I didn't analyze in precision. What uh, I was more concerned about the difference yeah. between these two then why the concrete numbers are, are are generated. But generally that's the, the observation that the, the Intel compiler is best in doing the vector, auto vectorization on groups without without dependency between the iterations. Mm -hmm.